Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the most exciting portion of your day. <laughs> At least until the 9 o'clock service. <laughs> okay. 9 o'clock today? Okay. Isaiah 35. Um, just to set the background on this. So the book of Isaiah, if you guys don't know, is actually written during the time of the kings. All right. So the way the Bible goes is um, Genesis, Exodus, become a nation, Leviticus and all that gets set up. They go to the land of Canaan, then King, uh, King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and then there are a bunch of kings after that. And then, so Isaiah prophesied during the time of the kings. This is significant for a couple re reasons. One of the things you're gonna see in the prophets is you're gonna start to see a lot of um, more clear language about Jesus coming. And the reason why you see it more, more, in, the, more in the prophets than anything else is because during the prophets, the glory of Israel is gone. During uh, King David's reign the, and, and King Solomon's reign, you could see the glory of Israel, right? Because for a long time they were, they were in exile and they came out of the desert and now they're planted in the land and they have like all this money and like, their country's been built up and the enemies around them are giving them respect. But during the time of the kings, their glory is gone. During the time of the kings, the power of Israel is faded and there are a bunch of empires to the east, Babylon and then later Assyria, who are rising up, right? Who are a lot more powerful and they basically they're taking advantage of Israel. So during this time, a lot of the Jews are wondering, I thought this is it. I thought when King David and King Solomon were here that we would see the kingdom of God. And so what the prophet started to say is that, yes, in some ways you did. In some ways you did see the kingdom of God. But now that in the, in the period of the kings, where the kings after King David and Solomon were like really bad, people were like, where's this kingdom of God? Right? If the kingdom of God is here, how come we are still like so oppressed by our enemies? How come we are starving? How come we don't see uh, any of the goodness of the kingdom of God? And so it is here that <clears throat> we start with Isaiah 35. <clears throat> Starting in verse 1. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord. The splendor of our God. Just so you guys know in that verse 1, the, the crocus, I looked this up, it's a flower. <laughs> it's like, a, it's like a, a flower that blooms along the the desert. I want, you to, I want you to look at this, verse 2. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon, and they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. This is what is known as a, as a, as a messianic prophecy in, in Scripture. And basically what it means is that um, for the people of Israel, what Isaiah is calling people to see is that there is a time that is coming, right? When someone is going to come, when, when that person comes, you're going to see the glory of Le Lebanon. Lebanon is the area. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. Carmel and Sharon are mountains in Israel. And they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. <clears throat> it's, it's hard to talk about who Jesus is. Um, because we, do you talk about him as an historical person? Do you just talk about him as the son of God? Do you just talk about him as a person who did good things? <coughs> and so <clears throat> what, the, what the prophets do is they paint this poetic language is, yes, he's all those things, but how do you see all those things together? Right? How do you see someone who is the son of God? How do you see someone who is a healer? How do you see someone who dies and rises again on the third day? And the way Isaiah describes it is this. <clears throat> Jesus is going to be the glory of Lebanon. He's going to be the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. And the people will see that Jesus himself is the glory of the Lord. He is the splendor of our God. And what is he going to do? In verse 3. So strengthen the feeble hands and steady the knees that give way. So say to those with, with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in, the, in the immediate context of when this is happening, um, this makes a lot of sense. Right. It makes a lot of sense because the people who Isaiah is prophesizing to you, there are people who are going to be at risk of war. Uh, if you guys know Israel's history, the Israelites of the northern kingdom get taken into exile. Right? They get taken into exile into, into Babylon. And then later on, the Syrians take the, the bottom half into exile also. So during, so during this time, um, sorry, it was first. The Syrians first, and then Babylon second. During this time, if you're, in, if you're in Israel, you have to wonder, there's not gonna be, is there going to be a king like David again? <laughs> right? 
Because for the Israelite history, you, you know that there was a person, there was a person like Moses first, took him out of Pharaoh, right? And then there's a person like Joshua to take him to the promised land. Then there's a person like David to fight the enemies. And so if you're in Israel, you're, you're wondering, okay, now, now we're in captivity, now we're in Babylon, right? Now we're in Assyria, now we're, you know, in the new, in the new Persia and all that stuff. What's going to happen now? And so the scripture says, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribu retribution. He will come to save you. What's going to start to happen um, in Israelite's history is that they're going to have to see that the glory of the Lord and the power of God is no longer going to come in, in a person who is just a person, right? Who's just another Israelite. Because in the past it has. In the past it was just people of God who led them, right? Out of slavery, out of the desert, um, into a new land. <clears throat> but, but the language starts to change a little bit in the, in the, in the prophets. The language changes and it says, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. The language starts to change away from persons like Moses, from a person like Joshua, to a person like Jesus, who only Jesus can become. Because here's why. Look at, look at uh, verse 5. Because then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute, mute tongue shout for joy. And water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. Jesus holds three offices. One is king, right? And the Israelites have already seen that. They've already seen a king like David and Solomon. Jesus is also a priest. And the people of Israel have already seen priests. Right? They've seen priests who go to the, go to the temple and they offer sacrifices. They go and um, they proclaim and they teach people from, from the word. And they've also seen prophets like, like Isaiah, like Elijah. Elijah did miracles. Something starts to happen though. In this language, you see, when, when God comes, he's going to bring vengeance and, and retribution like a king. But the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the death unstopped. There's no king who can do that. <laughs> All right. They, they have never seen a king yet in Israel who can open the eyes of the blind and then to unstop the ears of the death. So what's going to start to happen in, in this language now is that Isaiah is going to say, you guys have seen a, a glimpse of it before. You guys have seen prophets before. You guys have seen kings before. You guys have seen priests before. But what you're going to see is when the glory of the Lord comes, it's going to come in one person. All those three things are coming in one person now. And then the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy, and water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. I, I, didn't, I don't know why. I guess sometimes when you read the Bible too much, like you, you, get, you, get, you get used to this poetry, and you don't realize that like, it's crazy. There are not supposed to be streams in the desert. I have never seen a stream in a desert. <laughs> All right, um, you guys live in San Diego. We're actually a, a coastal desert, there's not this area right here, but like there's some parts of San Diego where it's just strip dry, right? When you guys know there's no rain here in San Diego. When God says He's bringing streams to the desert, what does that mean? Because he, God had created deserts, right? So if He wanted to have streams, He was not, he was not to create a desert, <laughs> right? He's able to not create a desert. He's able just to create like an Amazon rainforest area. But the fact that he creates the desert, desert first, and then brings streams through it. Now, and I, so I was thinking about that imagery, and also to the imagery of what, what the Israelites would see that as. You know, because of sin and because of the world we live in, there are dry places, right? Wilderness does exist. Now, I, the, the picture of wilderness for the Israelites, like the picture for us, it's like this wild, chaotic place. Right, where you're like you're not really sure what, what dangers are near you, what dangers are far from you, and when you think of the desert, you think of this dry place with no life can survive. And what God is saying is that in those places, right, water is going to gush forth, right, so you can build settlements there, right, and streams will happen in the desert, so you can so you can settle and be safe and not worry about do you have enough water to drink. Verse seven, and the burning sand will become a pool, and the thirsty ground bubbling the thirsty ground, bubbling springs, in the haunts where jackals once lay, grass, reeds, and papyrus will grow. What Isaiah is saying to his people is that when Jesus, when Jesus comes, the places that were once barren, the places that were once dangerous, the places that were once like, you're just so scared of, you know, being there, he's gonna make, he's gonna make pleasant. <laughs> All right, when the kingdom of God comes, he's gonna re redeem places. That, the idea of, of the jackal, right? 
where jackals once lay. It's like this place where like there's like just dead carcasses everywhere and there's death everywhere. But when God comes, new life is going to be brought there. And the highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it, and wicked fools will not go about on it. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. If you guys <coughs> remember, um, in the New Testament, in Acts, one of the early things the, the disciples, let's not call themselves, is followers of the way, right? And the, with a capital W. That's what this is referencing to, right? It's, it's referencing to this idea is that when, when Jesus comes and he says, follow me, and he starts leading them on a path, right? There actually is a path, right? It is actually a way of holiness. It will be called for those who walk on the way. When Jesus comes and rises again, he says, there, there is a path, there's, there is a journey I'm going to take you on, right? The journey is to the kingdom of God. And the, the imagery of this kingdom of God is streams and deserts, water rushing forth in the wilderness. It is a way of holiness, right? Where, the, where people of unbelief, where people of unclean hands are not going to be able to see, are not going to be able to walk on. So when, when, when Isaiah is prophesying this, it's both, it's both a promise and a warning, right? It's a promise because if you, when a king comes, he separates obedience and, and rebellion. When, when, a, when a priest comes, it sep he separates clean things and unclean things. When a prophet comes, right, he separates faith, faith in the things of God and disbelief in the things of God. With all these things together, so then there is a way you walk then, right? And that's a, that's a capital W way because it's more than just am I loyal or am I not loyal. It's more than just am I clean or not clean. It's all these things combined. So Isaiah says, there's a, there's a highway there, right? Highway's not like a, no, highway here. It's a highway meaning like a road a lot of people travel on. There is a way of holiness that is coming. It will be for those who walk on the way. And the unclean, they will not journey on it. And the wicked fools will not go about on it. Verse 9. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. It's, it's, it's crazy, we don't, we don't catch this because you guys read, you guys are more familiar with the New Testament. The idea of a redeemed doesn't exist in the, in, the, in the Old Testament if you think about it. Right? Redeemed from what? If you're in the Old Testament, the, the whole idea of redeemed is, is only in a physical sense. There's no spiritual sense yet of being redeemed. And so the, the, the language starts to happen, you start, the language starts to change in the Old Testament. It's saying that there is going to be a time where God is going to rescue you from your sins. Not just from physical enemies, not just from thirst, not just from like all these things that you're worried about in the physical sense. But the, la the language of Isaiah starts to change and starts to say, you're going to be redeemed one day. Right? The, the, is the focus of Israel is going to start to change. They're going to start to see like, you know what, it's not so much in the physical sense anymore. We're supposed to look in the spiritual sense of what God's going to do. And those the Lord has rescued will return. And they will enter Zion with singing. And everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will take them, overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Verse 10, and the Lord has rescued, and the, those the Lord has rescued will return, and they'll enter Zion with singing. You guys see in your Bible, that's a capital Z. Alright, capital Z Zion. Whenever you see whenever you see that happen in scripture, what, what we're referring to is both a here and a, and a, then to come. The, the idea of Zion, the city of Zion, the, the kingdom of our God, is this idea of where the, presence of where the presence of the Lord is, where he brings streams in the desert, where the deaf can hear again, where the blind can see, that is Zion. So you see a little bit of that on earth, right? You see that when, in the New Testament when Peter goes to the temple and he starts healing people. People start getting healed. Jesus starts healing people, right? You don't see that in a mass scale in the Old Testament. It happens a little bit, but not on a mass scale. The New Testament starts happening on a mass scale. Because the idea of the city of God is coming. The Zion is coming. Everlasting. Alright, some of these keys are starting to come now. Everlasting joy is coming. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. The language of God in Isaiah starts to change in this way that before all you guys knew was to know happiness for a day, or happiness for a week, or happiness for a reign of a king. New, new adjectives get 
the adjectives and adverbs start getting added on into Isaiah. Everlasting. Everlasting joy will happen. The city of God will be here forever. <clears throat> when, we, when we think about the resurrection of Jesus, it accomplishes a few things. The resurrection of Jesus, first of all, accomplishes our immediate salvation. Right? I don't know if you guys ever thought about this, but when, when Adam, Adam sins and God says you will surely die, you know, how, you know how many more years he lives for? <laughs> right? He lives for hundreds of more years. So if you think about that, you're like, wait a minute. You sinned very early on, right, after you were created. And then God says you will surely die. And then you go on to live for hundreds of years. Right? Like, if you imagine that, if that happened today in the courts, right, if I send someone to death and like, okay, I'm sending you to death, the sentence will be carried out in 80 years. <laughs> right? You're like, uh, it's not really a sentence. <clears throat> Why didn't Adam die right away? Right? Let me guess everything about that. Why didn't Adam die right away? If the wages of sin is death, Adam should have died right after he sinned. But for some reason, God gave him grace so that he would have life for a couple hundred more years even. And eventually he, he died. <laughs> okay. Up until the point of Jesus, there was, there was grace from death. Right? So people still lived hundreds of years and all these things. But it was when Jesus died and resurrected that we had new life. Before we had prolonged life, right? Before the grace of God, it was just prolonged life. So that guys like Methuselah, I think 900 years, right? We had prolonged life. In Jesus, we have new life. So when Jesus dies and resurrects, this whole, this whole new idea and concept of a, a resurrected body starts to happen in Scripture. <clears throat> when Jesus resurrects, something else happens to the apostles. Before they were able to cast out demons, before they were able to do um, mighty works, right? But after Jesus resurrects, everyone can do mighty works. One of the things that happens in Acts is that it was not just the apostles anymore, not just the 12 apostles anymore, not just the 70, not just the 500 anymore. Every single person in the New Testament now is able now to do miraculous things. When we, when we think about Easter Sunday, when we think about the resurrection of Jesus, right? I want, I want to take us back to this, this section of what did people say about Jesus before he came? The glory of God is saying that when, when God resurrects, when God comes to the world, he doesn't just take away our sin, but he brings in the kingdom of God. He brings in this idea that we're not gonna just, he's not gonna just stop suffering in this life, but there's gonna be everlasting joy in this life, right? That we're not gonna, we're not, we're gonna understand that a little bit, right? When we go to weddings and when we have like dinners and we have like hangouts like that, we feel joy. What that joy leads you to, should help you think about, is everlasting joy, right? There is a day coming where that joy doesn't stop, where you don't get tired when you go home and like wish you didn't go out <laughs> the night before, <laughs> all right? There's gonna, there's gonna be a day when, when sickness stops. Right now, you guys know Carmen, Carmen's at home sick, all right? Her stomach doesn't feel good. I, I was thinking about this message this weekend. Why do our bodies heal? If, if the wages of sin is death, and I know that we, we both sin, why do, we, why do our bodies heal? Right? Our bodies heal because the power of God in our bodies, using the phagocytes, I learned this last night on the website, <laughs> using phagocytes, she's out viruses from our body. Right? And for a little while, we're better. And then as we get older, our body takes longer and longer to, to get better, and then eventually we die someday. <laughs> but when our, I think when our bodies heal, I think it... it it helps us look forward to something, right? One day our body is ultimately going to be healed. One day our body is going to be like Jesus, ultimately healed. We're going to have a resurrected life like Jesus, right? The way we, we look forward to the resurrection of Jesus is to say, God, I thank you for all the benefits now. I thank you that I have new life now, that who I was before I was a Christian is different than who I was after I became a Christian. But in the same way, it helps to, to look forward and to say, God, when I when I see the resurrection, I, I realize that the kingdom of God is coming. <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna fi to finish with this. When I, um, whenever I go to China, I always think about, you know, I'm going to have only a few conversations for a few moments with, with some of these orphans, with some of these uh, the college kids I work with. And what is the most important thing I want to get across to them? 
one of the things you learn in cross-cultural ministry um, is you learn that you don't want to you don't want to put a culture on somebody, right? Like I don't I don't want to tell like a new Christian like, hey, now that you're a Christian, you have to like listen to hill songs, you have to like you know play guitars in service and like you know have service in a big church. <clears throat> it, it forces you to re, re, to reduce down away like the the trappings of Christianity to what it essentially is. And so when I tell someone about Jesus, there's actually a lot to say about Jesus, right? You don't want to tell them to follow Jesus, to love Jesus. Um, but I think ultimately what I want them to do is I want them to walk with Jesus in a way that transforms their life. To walk with him in a way that Jesus is more than just an idea. Because sometimes Jesus becomes an idea in our lives, right? Like, oh, don't forget, Jesus is watching. Okay, therefore, I'm going to not do bad things. All right, like, don't forget, Jesus is resurrected. Okay, therefore, I'm going to be happy. If Jesus is an, is an idea in our life, it doesn't, first of all, I don't think it gives us hope. Okay, because then you're kind of just kind of like holding yourself to an idea, holding yourself to a culture. <clears throat> if Jesus is a resurrected Savior, it changes the way we live. And I was, I was, I was thinking about this. Why do people get discouraged? Right? Like when we do ministry, when we burn out, when we get discouraged, why do you get discouraged? It, do you get discouraged because of hard work? I, I don't think so. I don't think that's a couple causes of discouragement. All right? Because again, when I was in the military, we had, you know, like 14, 18 hour days. <laughs> Right? And people actually weren't discouraged. <clears throat> you get discouraged when you lose hope. You get discouraged when you feel, is it always going to be this way? <laughs> All right, I know you guys watched the uh, YouTube video, David, David at the Dentist. Is this real? <laughs> is this forever? <laughs> but the idea of when, you, when you're going through sorrow and you feel, is it always going to be this way? That was when discouragement happens. Right is when you lose that there's going to be hope in the future. So one of the things I, I try to do, when, especially when I'm in China, when I when I talk to when I talk to young believers, new believers, people who never heard about Jesus, I want them to know that Jesus is more than an idea. He's a person who, when he walks with you, your life changes. And speaking of Resurrection Sunday, you have a hope that you never had before. Is that when you look to the future? Right, you don't just see death. You right, you don't just see like, man, I'm gonna die in 50 years. All right, I'm 20, I'm gonna die in 50 years. I'm 30, I'm gonna die in 40 years. But you start looking to the future and you're starting to say, man, there's gonna be hope. Right, there's gonna be hope that in my life, the things that I, I stress about and things that I'm sinful in, God's gonna change. Not only that, but the things that I worry about, God's gonna change. And even if nothing gets resolved in my life, at the end, we win. To live with that kind of hope, I think changes who we are as people. To live with the kind of hope is when you when you see, and you kind of think about it, right? In Christianity, we have a cross as like the symbol of our, our religion. <laughs> okay, it's an instrument of death. Because the reason why we have that is because when we see a desert, we see streams. When we see a wilderness, we see water gushing forth. Because that's the imagery in the Bible. So when we see a cross, we see the death of our Savior, which brings us life. I will leave it there, and hopefully Pastor, so Pastor Nick will pick it up at the 10 o'clock service. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you just for this time. I thank you um, that your son has risen on the third day. And God, now as we stand at the base of the cross, we just reflect on him and the hope he has given us, the new life he has given us. And I pray, Lord, that you would just encourage all of our hearts to strengthen us, um, to give us joy everlasting, um, to love you, to walk with you, and to follow you in all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.